Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And as, uh, as Susan mentioned, today's webinar uh, is one which, uh, which people have been asking for and one which, quite frankly, I've been anxious to put together and deliver as it allows me the opportunity to present to you in what I hope to be in very clear and helpful terms what over 40 years in this business has shown me with regard to needless energy waste. So over the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes, uh, I'd like to show you First of all, where many of these energy losses are occurring in various steam systems throughout the U.S. and Canada, throughout all of North America. And then, number two, what these losses amount to in dollars and cents. And then, why in so many cases the waste is allowed to continue. And how they can be largely mitigated or eliminated. And then lastly, the best approach one needs to take to get the energy savers implemented, at least based on my humble experience. So to begin with, and to put things in general perspective, the fuel spend in any manufacturing or process operation is a very significant part of the company's overall operating budget. And as you can see on the slide now, it totals almost 45% of this physical plant's operating cost. Now, of course, this percentage is going to vary depending upon the energy intensity of the operation, but suffice to say, energy is still going to be a big part of the overall operating cost. You know, as a matter of fact, the Department of Energy, the DOE, conducted a very intensive study of 200 processing plants of various sizes back in 2006 and determined through specific energy audits that approximately 5.2 quadrillion, yes, I mean quadrillion BTUs of energy, equating to 20% of the total energy spend could be saved. And they went on to determine the annual fuel spend ranged anywhere between 500000 a half a million dollars, to $20 million per year, and the average saving potential of these 200 plants worked out to be about $2.5 million. And the key thing to keep in mind here is the fuel that you are burning in the boiler or boilers is the same as burning cash. And it's not discretionary. In other words, you have to spend the money or you go out of business. So the only choice is to burn the fuel wisely because the spend is at risk and can only be saved through conservation. And when it is saved, this savings drops right to the bottom line. So where are the losses occurring? Now here you see a, a typical energy envelope showing where the majority of the losses occur. Now I'm going to touch on all of them except for heating combustion air for time's sake. And I'm not covering radiation loss as the boilers already have excellent insulation within the package itself. And unless it has been se severely compromised, it reduces radiation loss about as effectively as it possibly can, limiting the losses to anywhere from one to two percent at uh, high fire. So this then leaves us with the major loss within the envelope occurring with the boiler itself at about 20% and reflected as a stack loss. This means, think about this, for every $1 I spend or invest in fuel, I'm losing 20 cents of the stack. Other major areas of loss we'll be touching on today include steam leaks, some of which may be caused by bad traps. Radiation off of piping, fittings, and equipment. Losing condensate. Lower feed water temperatures than are necessary. And continuous blowdown waste. So in the final analysis, when you take these very typical losses into consideration, think about this now. For every dollar spent in fuel, you're only getting 61 to 73 cents out of that fuel in terms of useful BTUs. And it's this 27 to 39 cents of wasted energy, which is what we like to refer to as energy at risk. Now, either we save all or most of it, or we just dump it down the drain. Now, the other fact I've found over the years is that much of this waste is going on seemingly undetected. 
At least it appears that way. Now, it's not because of stupidity, but rather it's an unawareness problem, or it's a always been that way mentality, or it's not my problem attitude. Well, whatever the precipitative cause, it's rampant in many of our plants. However, I'm convinced with proper awareness training and the implementation of a sound energy saving program, including proper cost justification, this blatant energy waste problem can be dramatically reduced or eliminated entirely. So let's get started with a more focused analysis, starting with the biggest potential energy waster, which is the boiler, which forms the, the heart of any steam system and is pictured here in the lower left corner of the screen. So where do the excessive losses occur? Well, the major contributors to excessive losses are here on the screen. Fouled waterside and fireside surfaces. Remember, scale and soot are insulators, and for every 40 degree rise in stack temperature over the base point, you lose 1% in efficiency, and I'll go over this a little bit later. So the boilers need to be clean. Also, excessive cycling is another real culprit, which I've talked about in previous webinars. It's a real high energy waster, costing thousands of dollars annually because of the pre and post purge losses. And often, quite frankly, it goes on unnoticed. It's amazing. And then there's improper burner setup, causing poor combustion. Remember last month? For every 2% increase in O2, we lose another 1% in efficiency. So if we're originally set up to maintain 3% O2 and we drift unknowingly to 7%, we've lost 2% overall. And this happens all the time. So what do I do about all this? Well, as indicated on the slide, it all starts with an experienced service technician inspecting the border. This is probably during its annual inspection when it's down and drained anyway. Checking the waterside and fireside surfaces for cleanliness. This might mean an acid cleaning, or it might need, mean that the, uh, the, the fireside, of course, is, is fouled because of the scale, or it might be sooted on the fireside and it needs to have that soot removed or cleaned, vacuumed. So it could be an acid cleaning, it could be vacuuming, it could be both. And then following this, the boiler will be closed and refilled and a complete tune-up should be initiated, including the resetting of combustion, which also includes combustion analysis throughout the burner's complete turndown range. Now, this is also a good time after the boiler has been cleaned and tuned to watch the operation of the border during normal production hours, extremely important. Is it cycling excessively? Well, maybe the border is oversized for load, or the burner doesn't have the turndown required to match the varying conditions. So, possibly a smaller capacity border is in order, or maybe a new burner with higher turndown capability. Now, during the inspection, the technician may also notice that the fuel-air control linkages are loose and worn and need to be replaced. Well, maybe it's time to consider parallel positioning, assuring repeatable fuel-air control time after time. Or maybe it's noticed that the ambient air temperature changes considerably. And it's not only during the seasonal changes, but during the course of the day. Again, throwing off the fuel-air ratio and costing wasted fuel dollars, saying nothing about the possible safety aspects. And this is when you consider the purchase of an oxygen trim system. Or when everything is said and done, maybe everything is just fine and the boiler just needed to be cleaned and tuned, after which significant energy will be saved just because of this relatively inexpensive servicing. In any case, we've gotten to the point where the decisions may need to be made for investing capital dollars to save these energy dollars at risk. And to do that, we have to quantify and defend the capital outlay. And this is where many cost justifications begin to fall apart. For instance, we're burning natural gas, but the meter serving the plant is not only serving the boiler, 
it's serving other energy users as well. So we need to install another gas feeder, which only shows the border's fuel consumption. Sounds pretty basic, but believe me, it's often not done. So, okay, we've installed a separate gas meter showing us what the border is consuming in fuel energy throughout the typical process day. And we have some ideas of what needs or needs not to be done with our potentially biggest energy waster, the boiler. But what else in the system should I go after? Well, if were my money, the first thing I'd look at after the boiler is the insulation on my steam and condensate piping and the support equipment, such as the boiler's feed tank or the deaerator. Allow me to show you why. Here's a six inch steam pipe at 100 pounds of pressure. It radiates approximately 1,650 BTUs per hour per foot. Now, let's just figure we have 500 feet of uninsulated pipe. That's 25 border horsepower that's radiating off. 25 horsepower. That heat is going into the building, heating it up in the dead of summer. Windows are all open. Fans are blowing, or maybe we, we might even have some air-conditioned space. Production hours, 4,000 hours per year, conservative. 65 cents per therm. Look at the waste, 21,476. $500,000 per year fuel bill, 5%. So what else would I go after? Well, it would be steam leaks many which have probably been going on for years and nobody has assumed the responsibility to do anything about it. It's been going on forever. Hell, I don't have the time. they give me so much other stuff to do. But you know the drill. But remember, we're burning cash, and a lot of it. And with fuel bills in the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, one or two percent in savings can add up to a pot full of bucks. Let me show you what I mean with regard to steam leaks. As you can see on this chart, if we assume an operating pressure of 100 pounds PSIG gauge and, I, and a combined total leak opening, let's say equals a half an inch, and we assume a conservative cost of steam at $7.50 per thousand pounds, that's a loss of almost $56,000 per year. And then please note the multipliers at the bottom of the chart if the operating pressure is above or below this operating pressure of 100 pounds. And many processes run well above 100 pounds, so the gray highlights are very important factors as well. And remember, too, with these steam leaks, there's other collateral costs tied to them, such as the loss of chemicals and increased water and sewer charges because these gallons of water have to be made up. All right, so far we've addressed the boiler and some of the potential piping losses. What else should I be looking at? Well, again, for my money, I'd be looking at my condensate return system. Now, keep in mind, the condensate is nothing more than the steam, which has done its work, given up its latent energy, and has gone back to the liquid state and contains a ton of BTUs, which we like to refer to or do refer to as sensible energy. That energy required to get the pound of water saturated to the point where any further BTU add will cause the pound of water to go through a phase change and turn to a gas or turn to steam. So we want to save as much of this sensible energy as possible. The higher the temperature, the better. Just means my burner has to do that much less. So it's really important that we capture this condensate as effectively as possible as it is forming in the steam header. And to do this effectively, we need to have properly sized drip pockets positioned along the steam mains to allow the condensate to fall out of the header and then be trapped. Now, an interesting thing to note is the velocity of the steam in the header is probably in the area of 6,000 to 8,000 feet per minute. 
which equates to between 70 and 90 miles per hour, which also means that condensate is moving fairly rapidly as well. And if the pocket is not large enough, the condensate will not be adequately trapped because it can't find the pocket. As a matter of fact, there are specific minimum diameters for drip pockets. For instance, for an 8-inch main, the minimum is 4-inch. And for a 14-inch main, it's 8-inch. Now, the intervals for these pockets is about every 300 feet and also before all bends and valves. And it should never, these pockets should never exceed 500 line, lineal feet. Okay, so every 300 feet. And then there are those secondary steam distribution or branch lines which often accumulate fairly large amounts of condensate. Now it's possible in these situations an inline separator may be just what the doctor ordered in most effectively removing the condensate and then delivering it to the trap where it can be properly channeled to the condensate return system. And speaking of traps, it's not my intent today to go into any great amount of detail about specific traps, their various designs, operation and applications, except to say uh, a trap, regardless of its specific type, has been designed to do three things. Trap steam, remove condensate, and then remove some air. And its proper location in the piping system, along with its proper selection, its sizing and functioning, go a long way in saving the precious condensate we like to refer to as liquid gold. So often, we find these traps not functioning properly, blowing through, causing large amounts of steam to be wasted or backing up condensate, as you'll see in this slide, where we have a closed loop system with a modulating load controlled through a temperature sensing modulating control valve. Now, you'll note too, the discharge pressure from the trap, its back pressure, is greater than the inlet pressure. I've got 11 pounds at the discharge, 10 pounds at the inlet. So we've lost our differential across the trap, essentially rendering it useless and allowing condensate to back up into the process or into the heat exchanger in this case. Now, this not only precipitates damaging water hammer, but we've reduced the heating capacity of the heat exchanger by almost 50%. So it's needless loss of energy and possibly product waste as well as the batch could be temperature and time sensitive. I also mentioned one of the functions of a properly operating trap is to partially eliminate air. That doesn't mean that we don't need air vents in our system. We do. But, and that, because we've got to get rid of that air. And as you can see on the slide now, air is another contributor to wasted energy because as little as one half of 1% of air in the steam can rob 50% of its heat transfer effectiveness. So again, more dollars down the drain, and oftentimes, we are totally unaware. You know, I mentioned before and, and showed you an example of a condensate uh, backing up into a heat exchanger because the trap had lost its differential due to the back pressure on the trap, which was exceeding the inlet pressure. And, and that's one of the main reasons why we see vented steam coming through the roofs of many industrial plants. Ever thinking for a moment of how much we're totally wasting. We just want to make sure production isn't halted or adversely affected by water logging the process equipment. So we just vent off and reduce the pressure. Well, how can we have the best of both worlds? Well, the answer to the problem is to capture this waste using a flash recovery system. With this equipment, the high temperature, high pressure condensate enters the tank and is allowed to flash off as steam before the remaining liquid enters a lower pressure condensate return line. This steam can then be used for deaeration, water feed water heating, or maybe for another low pressure heating or process load, provided, and I underline this, provided the condensate is coming from a continuous source, not a modulating load. And how much can I expect to recover from flash steam? 
Well, as you can see on the screen now, the answer involves a formula which takes the sensible heat from the high pressure side minus the sensible heat from the low pressure side, that would be the condensate side, and divide that result by the latent heat from the low pressure side. Now, of course, the lower the condensate return pressure, the greater the amount of flash steam. But normally, this equates to about 7 to 8 percent on average, but can be as high as 10 to 15 percent. Now, another way to recover energy and put it back into the border feed water is through the use of a continuous blowdown heat recovery system. Now, in this case, we are taking border water, which is being continuously discharged in order to control the border's TDS level. Now, rather than taking this very valuable effluent to drain, we take it to a heat exchanger, which has been sized to preheat raw, cold makeup water before it goes to the deaerator or the border's vented feed water tank. We're increasing the border's efficiency because these otherwise wasted BTUs are now providing sensible energy to the water, meaning the burner doesn't have to burn as much fuel to heat it to the saturation temperature. Because for every 10 degree increase in boiler feed water temperature, we gain 1% in efficiency. So depending on the size of your fuel bill, this can be a great way to save energy dollars and realize a fine payback. And then there's the stack economizer, which is also used to preheat feed water before going to the deaerator, or before going to the border, I should say. The one you see here is what we refer to as a standard economizer, meaning it doesn't allow the products of combustion, the flue gas, to condense. For instance, with a natural gas, where with natural gas, the dew point is about 130 degrees, at which it gives up its latent energy and then becomes a liquid. So with these economizers, we are grabbing as much sensible energy from the flue gas as possible before it condenses and then transfers those BTUs into the boiler feed water before it goes into the boiler. And then there's also condensing economizers. Now, these are employed under certain conditions when a sufficient heat sink is available to allow the products of combustion to condense recovering the latent energy in addition to the sensible energy recovered in a non-condensing economizer. Now, in this particular case, I'm showing you a dual economizer which combines both a non-condensing and a condensing economizer into a single common package because I have not only the border feed water coming from the deaerator to be further heated before going to the border, but I also have a fairly large load of cold water which needs to be heated for things like CIP, clean in place, domestic use, or, or just preheating border makeup water before going to the deaerator. Here, uh, let me show you uh, what I mean. On the screen now, you see a schematic of a two-stage economizer with the lower section taking the feed water stream from the DA and adding additional sensible heat from the stack before the water goes to the boiler. Now the top portion of the economizer is made of stainless steel fin tubes and it is accepting cold water, let's say between 50 and 55 degrees, and heating it for some purpose while at the same time taking the flue gas down to its dew point and thereby grab grabbing its latent heat or latent energy. This further increases the border efficiency, adding any, another 2.5 to 7.5% of efficiency, making the overall efficiency gain anywhere from 5 to 10%. Now, the variance in efficiency is dependent upon the actual cold water temperature and its mass flow or its quantity. You know, I said before that for every 10 degree rise in border feed water temperature, you gain 1% in efficiency. But another way to look at it, which I briefly mentioned before, and especially when you're heating water which isn't going to the boiler itself, is for every 40 degree drop in stack temperature against a specific benchmark, including operating pressure, 
ambient temperature and firing rate, you gain 1% in efficiency. Now, it's very critical, though, that you are sure you are comparing the same benchmark conditions when drawing the conclusion as the benchmark factors that I'm showing you on the screen now will vary your results dramatically. So far, we've been focusing on the border, its losses, and the losses in the steam supply and return systems, which can save us considerable cash, but have said nothing, as yet at least, about those pieces of equipment which get the water into the border before it becomes steam. And that's exactly what you see on the screen now. The tanks which transport the condensate to the primary boiler feed tank, that's the one on the right labeled condensate tank. And then the boiler feed can either be a deaerator or a vented receiver, which is the one labeled the boiler feed system. Now, from an energy saving perspective, the DA or the deaerator is the preferred boiler feed system as it allows much higher temperature condensate to be returned, saving a lot of sensible energy and saving on the fuel bill. Now, most standard deaerators are rated at 50 pounds design pressure and operate anywhere between 5 and 20 pounds. So this then allows a feed water temperature to the boiler between 230 to 260 degrees, depending upon the, the pressure, the operating pressure. However, there are also high pressure deaerator systems available, which can accept condensate at pressures well above 50 pounds and for pressures operating at at, and I should say for borders operating at pressures over 150 pounds. This should be a serious consideration because the higher the pressure, the higher the boiling point, so the hotter the condensate returned, the less energy coming from my burner. Now, in the case of the border feed system, as mentioned, it's vented, which means anything over 212 degrees Fahrenheit will flash off and be vented to atmosphere losing this valuable energy that we spoke about earlier. Now, there are many of these out there, vented condensate receivers or atmospheric condensate receivers, condensate tanks, and they're obviously less expensive initially. But like the old Fram filter commercial used to say, you need to ask yourself, do I pay me now or do I pay me later? Okay, we've talked about a number of ways to save energy, which I like to refer to as picking dollars off the floor. Now let's look at a couple of the easier ones I've mentioned and see how they measure up in terms of savings when I have a 500 horsepower high pressure steam boiler operating 4,000 hours per year and I'm burning natural gas and my annual fuel bill is $500,000 a year. The first one we'll look at is piping insulation, but rather than a six inch line that we looked at earlier, it's an eight inch line. So you can see the same operating pressure, 100 pounds, 500 lineal feet, gas at 65 cents, 4,000 hours per year, $26,845 in this case wasted just because it went from six inch to eight inch. 6% of the fuel bill. And then you'll recall we looked at capturing flash steam when we were coming off a process and going into a condensate return line with a lower pressure. 500 horsepower border, 17,000 pounds per hour is what that generates. Loses approximately 7% through venting. 4,000, 4,760,000 pounds per year lost. 750 per thousand pounds, conservative. $35,700 wasted, 8% of that fuel bill. Or what about capturing the BTU losses from continuous blowdown? Every 10 degrees, save 1%. Fuel bill, $500,000. Let's say I only pick up 10 degrees, 5,000 bucks per year. 20 degrees, very, very possible, $10,000. Another excellent saving opportunity we reviewed was capturing the stack losses. And in this particular case, we'll just look at a standard economizer saving a nominal amount. 
So we're not condensing, as you can see. We're increasing that feed water temperature as it comes from the feed water tank or from the deaerator before it goes into the boiler. Nominal savings, 2 to 5 percent. Fuel bill, 500,000, 2 percent, 10 grand a year. Double it, or, 20, or more than double it, at 5 percent, $25,000 per year. Okay, so what if I do all of these? What if I put in a continuous blowdown system, flash steam recovery, economizer, and insulate my pipes? Well, on that example that we set up, this scenario that we developed here, 500 horsepower boiler, 4,000 hours per year, between $78,000 to $98,000 per year. All right, we have all these great ideas on how we can save so much money, delivering it all to the bottom line, these savings. But why do I always get my projects disapproved, rejected, or just ignored? Well, one of the main reasons I've found through the years of experience is many, if not most, of our organizations are comprised of silos, with each operation or department responsible for their own P&L, which eventually consolidates, but until it does, it's every man for himself even though the energy spend affects the entire organization and uses the same dollars we're trying to maximize and increase through increased market share, reduced production cost, increased productivity, innovation, and so on. Everyone wants the biggest piece of a limited pie. Another major problem is the sharks in the organization comprised of the executive team and the financial people often look upon the energy spend as a cost of doing business and it's not discretionary. Either you spend the money for fuel or you go out of business. So find a cheaper way, you know, find some cheaper fuel, get a better price on that natural gas. There's no choice. You know, they'd rather look at other ways to generate cash for the business. The boiler and its associated energy dollar gobblers are out of sight and out of mind. But wait a minute. You know, maybe we share in the blame. Maybe we've never presented our capital project in a way that they could relate. And what I'm talking about here is certainly a mistake that I used to make when I was doing consultative selling for energy saving investments until I finally realized the error of my ways. I used to always present the project payback in simple payback terms and never allowed for the other costs that the chief executives and the financial people of the organization were looking for. For instance, the people controlling the purse strings are looking for things like this, the opportunity cost for this cash. What's this investment's net present value? Is it positive? What about its internal rate of return as realized at its discounted rate over time? What kind of return are we getting as compared with the company's hurdle rate? In other words, what's my minimum return that I will accept? What's the level of risk with this involvement? Is it a slam dunk? Maybe it is. And then make sure you include all the possible costs associated with the investment as highlighted in the light blue bullet points below, those last six. And then when I'd mentioned these things to many of the contacts I was working with at various companies, this is the reaction I'd get. Well, you know, that's all well and good, Steve, but I'm not capable of pulling the financials together for a credible presentation. You know, can you help? Well, to be perfectly honest, the calculations were not in my wheelhouse either, but thankfully, I was aware of some excellent financial tools which would do it all for us, given the correct knowns to input in order to compute the final results. For instance, there's a website shown on the screen now, www.energypathfinder.com, which takes you to a tool used to demonstrate the process of recovering capital for energy saving initiatives and then calculating the results for you presenting them in a unique way by showing how many dollars are wasted by not, provided, by not providing this recommended solution. Kind of a unique way of presenting it. And then Cleaver Brooks has an electronic tool 
which we are constantly improving upon, and used for evaluating energy saving projects, and it's called BOOST, as you can see here. With this program, all of the required project information is fed in, including the cost of the equipment, the implementation cost, including the one-time costs, the customer's tax rate and their discount rate extended over the depreciation period of the asset, which could be anywhere from 20 years or less. And in the end, it provides you with the actual payback, payback and after-tax dollars, including the net present value of the option and its internal rate of return. Now, with this kind of report reflecting the true costs and the projected annual savings in real dollars returned, the executives and financial people in the various organizations are much more likely to see the legitimacy of the recommendation, giving it equal consideration along with other requests involving product-related projects which always appeared to have the greatest assurance of positive cash flow and payback. You know, it's, it's like a lot of things in life. It's not whether a request is legitimate or not. It's how it was requested and presented that counts. Energy saving projects can save real dollars for the organizations burning large amounts of cash every year. And putting those dollars back into the company's coffers can go a real long way in not only improving the bottom line, but also helping the company to helpfully grow in the process. Make sense? So, here are some of the key points to take away from today's session, at least the way I see it. Average, on average, 61 to 73 cents per dollar is usable energy in an industrial process plant, meaning we are losing the balance or the reciprocal. The border is the biggest loser of energy. Over 20% is lost and much is recoverable. Regular border inspection and tuning is a must. A 40 degree rise in stack temperature against a benchmark is a 1% loss. Remember the benchmark. If you're charting a particular Gas temperature in the stack, flue gas temperature. It's got to be at the same firing rate, ambient temperature, and pressure. Otherwise, you're going to be mixing apples and oranges. A 10 degree rise in feed water temperature equals a 1% increase in efficiency. Condensate is liquid gold. Drip pockets and properly operating traps are